I don't think it's just me. Anyone else have a hard time explaining why people do what they do? We're, we're complicated, right? It's not just me. Oh, why do we do what we do? Why do I do what I do, <laughs> right? Uh, the fact is there's a bunch of unseen motivations, pulls, temptations that uh, explain why people do the things we do. And one of them would be called power. We're all just, I mean, part of being human is being somewhere on the spectrum between being overtly and unconsciously motivated by and drawn toward wanting power in some form. And it looks very different, but uh, power is a dialect of pride that speaks loudly, sometimes in really subtle ways that are hard to diagnose. Wanting power explains everything to why we hurt people. It also explains why we get offended. It explains why we go for it hard, why we're aggressive, and also why we're scared to do anything. Wanting power explains why we don't do what God's called us to do. It explains why we're not generous. It explains why we're afraid of strangers at times. It even explains why a lot of us don't have vulnerable, supportive relationships. Now, I don't know anyone who will have the evil villain laugh and uh, talk about their unquenchable thirst for power. Maybe you do, but you know what we all do? We, we gossip about people, putting other people down because it makes us feel a little better, give us a sense of superiority, or we complain when the actions of other people take away our control or offend us in a little way. We, uh, we get upset when we're not respected or considered. Those are all power struggles. We just don't normally label it like that. And it's probably because for Christians, we all say that Jesus has all the power, right? We would all sing a song that says something, we take our crowns off and lay it at the feet of Jesus. We say Jesus is Lord, and yet, even in the presence of the Lord, we have trouble escaping from the shadow of what I'm just crassly labeling today as power. Wanting it, being afraid of losing it, motivates us all in ways that we don't always see or identify about ourselves. Now today, we're telling this story about someone whose central theme is power, someone who is nakedly uh, driven by a drive for control. And of course, there's a bit of irony in loving power. You might know this, but the more you need it, the less you have it. So the character we're talking about today is completely powerless because he wants power so much. He's afraid of what other people think about him. He actually is very powerful, but he wants to be respected and influential. And like so many people who love power, the desire for power blinds him to what's going on. And today we're going to look at his story, and I think we can learn a lot both about the dangers of being motivated too much by temporary power, and we get to hear what Jesus says about a very different way of living. We're, of course, telling the very tragic story of Pontius Pilate, a central and tragic story in Easter, and one who has a lot to teach us about the very human struggle with power. And we, of course, are in a sermon series called The Characters of Easter. I love telling the greatest story ever told. I am convinced that as we approach the resurrection, uh, celebrating Easter, this next couple weeks will be more uh, life-giving and sustaining and energizing for you if you're willing to pause and listen to the greatest story ever told. I, I want to give credit to people I've learned from. This series is uh, uh, adopted from a, a book by the same title, and you're hearing a lot of Daniel Darling's influence today. And just one more warning here. I'm covering a lot of information here. We could spend weeks talking about the scripture verses I'll put on the screen. Uh, just fair warning, I'm going to summarize a lot of them that you'll find in your handout or uh, on the screen behind me. All right, no more warnings. Let me tell you the story of Pilate. Okay, to understand Pontius Pilate, you kind of have to get a big picture and understand the big power dynamic political picture of ancient Israel. So to zoom out a little bit, uh, what does power look like in the story of Jesus? And you'd have to say it starts with Herod. And uh, you need to know something about the, the word Herod. It's, a, uh, it's not a first name, it's a title. 
So when you read the Bible, it's very confusing. There's a bunch of things named Herod, and they're often different. The first one you find in the Bible story is someone history would call Herod the Great. He rules the entire region for about 40 years, right up until right around after Jesus was born. Herod was great. In fact, he built the large aqueducts you can still visit in Israel today, and they've lasted for thousands of years. He's also responsible for building the temple, which was destroyed, but still to this day, when you see pictures or some of you perhaps have gone to Israel and seen the Western Wall, Herod the Great built that. An incredible legacy. A lot of power, a lot of legacy here. But here's the thing about uh, about power. Do you know how much power you need? Do you know how much power you're hungry for? Well, a little bit more for a little bit longer. And the more power you have, the bigger risk you have to lose it. So Herod the Great famously was incredibly insecure. The way it worked back then, if you were a king and you died, your sons took over. So uh, I can't even say this without thinking about how terrible it is. He had three sons in a row killed. So they wouldn't do away with him. He had his wife killed. You may know from the second chapter of Matthew, and I, I was going to put a picture up, I just can't, man, I, I couldn't even like process what this must have been like. Herod the Great in Matthew 2 had all of the boy toddlers in Bethlehem murdered because the wise men said that a new king of the Jews would be born, and he was so insecure, worried, I guess, about one of these kids taking over his throne that he committed genocide. That's what the story of Herod the Great looks like. Obviously, the problem is no matter how powerful you are, you die eventually. So when Herod the Great died, he passed his kingdom on to three additional sons, Herod Philip, Herod Antipas, and Herod uh, Archelaus. And the one that you find in the Israel story at this time is usually Herod Antipas. You find Agrippa showing up later. But Herod Antipas was a king over the territory of Galilee, so Jesus did a lot there. You may know him in the Bible as the king that ordered John the Baptist to be beheaded. And if you remember the story, what did John the Baptist do? John the Baptist talked about an adulterous affair between Herod Antipas and the wife of his brother, which would have been Herod Herod Philip. So that's the guy... Herod Antipas, the beheader of John the Baptist, is the one who Jesus appears before in his trial. Okay, everyone hang on. Now, if any of that sounds like a bit of a mess, a little bit cruel, a little bit like a part of the world you wouldn't want to live in, you and the Roman emperor, Tiberius, have a lot of things in common. (laughs) Roman Rulers just wanted peace and productivity, and none of that was happening with the Herods. And like, what I would have done is I would have gotten rid of the bad kings and put someone else in charge. But instead of that, Rome kept the Herods and sent a governor to try and bring peace. And that man with the unenviable job was someone named Pontius Pilate. He got the job because he had a friend who was very high in power, but I don't know if this friend liked him or not, because what a horrible job. Like, can you imagine? Uh, good news, you're a governor. Isn't that, doesn't that sound fun? The bad news is uh, there's three King Herods. You can't get rid of them, and they're awful. <laughs> and your job is to try and make it peaceful. Also, they hate you. <laughs> um, not, a hard, not an easy job. Oh, also, you have to figure out Orthodox Jewish laws and customs. And it won't surprise anybody to know that in history, pilots job didn't go well. Let let me just, can I give you a little bit more history here? Let me tell you about Pilate. (laughs) One time, to uh, just sort of flex a little bit, let me tell you what he did. Pilate orders Roman soldiers to place large defensive shields, like military stuff, but with large pictures of Caesar all over Israel, which would have been incredibly offensive to the Jews back then. Having a picture in a religious space was a breach of the Ten Commandments for them. Uh, The Jewish people, uh, they they had a riot. They were violent. 
They like, chased Pilate out of his palace, and Pilate just said, okay, forget about it. And he learned something from that riot, because another time, Pilate needed to get fresh water to Jerusalem. Projects involving water are expensive, so Pilate robbed the temple. He goes in and took the treasure, but he was smart. He goes, there's going to be another riot. So Pilate, according to history, took Roman soldiers, disguised them as Jewish protesters. So in the middle of the riot, he had his soldiers stab the loudest rioters to discourage the protest while Pilate robbed the temple. What a guy, right? Another time... And we don't know much about this story. According to, to Luke, people were talking about that Pilate had... Think about this verse. This is a real verse. Pilate had uh, Galileans in worship murdered while they were uh, worshiping. Here's a guy who tried violence to stop violence, and you could probably guess that none of it worked. His only job was to bring peace, law and order, and it wasn't working, and he was getting awful job reviews from anyone who reviewed him. History tells us that the man that he knew who recommended him for the job was actually caught up in his own drama, and he was executed, so Pilate had no one to protect him and is very insecure. That's the man Pilate, as we know him. Uh, No one likes him. He has a terrible job, and he's doing a bad job at it. And as weird as this history is, I, you know, you may not ever have that sort of power and violence at your hands, but I think on a really brutal scale, Pilate thinks like all of us do, who get insecure or desperate. And you're not slaughtering anyone, I hope, uh, but I'll bet some of you will lead Uh, are tempted to leave angry Google reviews when the pizza place gets your order wrong, right? If they knew how important I was, they wouldn't mess up my order like that. Anyone else think that sometimes? You ever get that feeling like, you know, people don't care enough about my own preferences? That's exactly what Pilate's feeling. That's what's motivating him, this insecurity that upsets him. That's power. And he's about to meet Jesus. If you know the story, by the time Jesus goes before Pilate, it had become a capital punishment case, which is a little bit strange because the charge brought against Jesus by the Jewish leaders would have, according to Jewish law, would have been punishable by stoning, and uh, society did that a lot without any uh, thumbs up from the state, but for reasons I'll speculate about. The Jewish leaders hated Jesus enough to bring it, well, they wanted a billboard sort of execution. Which raises another question. Like, I get Pilate, he's motivated by power, he's insecure because he might lose it. But what was the motive? You ever wonder, like, why did why was there a riot to kill Jesus? Like, why, you know, and, and like, why was stoning not good enough? <laughs> what motivates folks? Here's my theory. I think that the people who crucified Jesus were motivated by, any guesses? Power. Jesus, for his whole career, had criticized the hypocrisy of the religious establishment. During Roman rule, these religious leaders were very powerful. They ran uh, the show. They had a lot of governmental power. And Jesus threatened to turn all of that upside down. And it seems like they were so worried about losing their power and respect that they wanted to take it all the way up to a state-run public execution to squash those ideas. So what they did is they dragged Jesus to Pilate's Jerusalem palace, and they brought a simple charge. We found this man, Jesus, misleading our nation, opposing payment of taxes to Caesar and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. So three legal charges, the charge of insurrection, he's misleading the nation, starting riots and revolution, which isn't true. But what they are saying to Pilate is, look, your job is to keep the peace and uh, you want people to submit to Rome's rule, uh, 
doing your job should look like squashing this person. The second charge, Jesus opposes paying taxes to Caesar, a big part of Pilate's job, but not a true charge against Jesus. But uh, Pilate, Jesus hurting your revenue stream. The last charge is that Jesus is trying to overthrow the establishment to lead an attempted coup to become his own king. Uh, What do all three of these charges have in common? You want to guess again this time? Power, right? Why was Jesus crucified? At, At one level, the charges have a lot to do with the fact that Jesus threatens to change the status quo for the most powerful, which, by the way, is something that Jesus still does. And following Christ in that way is still threatening in some ways. But you can imagine Pilate's spot. He's on thin ice in Rome. He goes home, the story says, and instead of getting comfort from his wife, a lot of folks speculate that his wife was an earlier follower of Christ. She pleads with him to, follow, uh, to let Jesus go and to make it more fun. Just in case you don't know, uh, severance packages were different back then. When Roman governors were canned, they, um, they often had their heads literally severed from their bodies. They were executed or forced to commit suicide in some way. So this is, I mean, there's a lot at stake for Pilate right now. So Pilate, as you can imagine, wants none of this. So he sort of goes, I find no ground for charges. You know, there's no crime against Rome here. There's no legal case. Go stone him if you want, but this is not a Roman thing. Um, and it, at one level, the entire passion story is political theater. Um, what do you do in this case if you're Pilate? Pilate has two chess moves. The first move is the jurisdictional rule. So the first thing he does, he sends Jesus to Herod, who is in town for Passover. He's in charge of Galilee anyway. This seems like a Galilean thing. Uh, Herod ha- is having nothing to do with this. So Pilate has one more move. Every year around Passover, they would release one Jewish prisoner to celebrate Passover and sort of get some sort of goodwill, and that doesn't work. Um, The religious leaders cry out for the release of an actual domestic terrorist who led an actual uh, insurrection against Rome, and uh, which tells you just how serious they are about putting Jesus on display. When you read this story, I think the worst thing for Pilate is this line that the Sanhedrin assembled a mob who demanded the death of Christ. The mob, that would, that's what would do Pilate in. So Pilate has Jesus flogged, which is very close to death. It's torture. Jesus gave maybe a literal pound of flesh, hoping Pilate would be hoping that this would satisfy the crowd, but it didn't. They wanted their threat to power silence. And Pilate knows, like, nothing Jesus did would warrant a Roman public execution. But he also knew what was at stake. There's a crowd out there. His claim to power was at stake. His career was at stake. If he did the right thing and released Jesus, he might be done. In fact, uh, history says that shortly after this, There was another riot, the Samaritans rioted, and he was sent off to Rome to never be seen again. That's Pilate. What do you say? Can can you imagine being in that room with Pilate as he thinks about this? Here's what's fascinating to me. Do you know who was in that room? Jesus was. And we get to see what Jesus did in the middle of this. And I, I don't have the time to do this justice, but... In the book of John, you get this amazing back and forth between Jesus Christ and Pilate. And what what you see when you read it in John is Pilate gets a lesson about power. Jesus teaches Pilate about real power. At the time, everybody from Pilate to the crowds to everyone in Jerusalem, everybody knows Jesus isn't plotting the same kind of insurrection that Barabbas was. So when Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? I don't know that anyone's surprised when Jesus says, my kingdom is 
not of this world. What does Jesus mean by that? I think what Jesus is saying on one level is that the kingdom of God is a bit above all of the temporary battles and skirmishes and personal politics that we spend all our time in. In this case, Jesus is shooting at something higher than the Sanhedrin and Pilate, both of whom are out of power in the next couple of years. The kingdom of God, Jesus is king over the whole world. Crown him with many crowns, we sang. Over the renewal of the cosmos, bringing heaven to earth. This is not the same dimension that Pilate is on. But this is why Jesus did not command the angel armies. This is why he stopped his followers from swinging swords. Because his kingdom is not of of this world. And somehow, Jesus' pathway to power went through that very cross that Pilate is so hesitant to send him to. This is fascinating. But I think what Jesus says to Pilate is on one level what we all need to hear when we're motivated too much by power. We need to see the kingdom of God. This is the problem, right? The problem with power is it blinds us to what's really important. So Jesus is saying, look, there is something bigger going on than what you see right now. Pilate, this is a weird, demog- uh, it's a weird dynamic. Pilate thinks he's trying to save Jesus. Jesus is, is saving Pilate. It looks like Jesus is out of control with his life at stake. But that's really the case for Pilate. The question is, what's Pilate going to do? So, so Pilate asks the question, you'll see in your handout, so you are a king then? And Jesus answers, I was born for this. I have come into the world for this to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. That's John 18. And Pilate, this fascinates me. Really interesting text. Pilate's like, what? Do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you know that I have the power to release you, the authority to crucify you? Jesus, don't you know how powerful I am? Pilate says, I have so much control right now. You should be so worried about yourself. And Jesus says, he goes, big picture. You would have no authority over me at all if it had not been given you from above. In other words, even in the injustice of Pilate killing the Son of Man, even in that, somehow, God sits on the throne. In every generation, powerful people put themselves in the place of God but they are never a threat to the quiet, eternal power of the real king. So even as Jesus, as our creed says, suffered under Pontius Pilate, the truth is, Pilate suffers for not humbling himself before the real power the one that God has given a name above all name who is crowned with glory and honor. Power is a trap. It can blind you. It can make all of us do things that we don't really want to do when we, we think that we're bigger than we really are. Power is a trap when you're an emperor When you're a governor, it's a trap. When you're a servant, power is a trap. When you've got the power to call someone up on the phone and order pizza, right? You don't actually have to be powerful. But when all you can see is your own little kingdom, your own little self, it motivates you to go hard or to get really defensive. The pursuit of power motivates you to hate people. It motivates you to be risk-averse and easily offended. Power can make you so that you are so concerned about what you've got that you're more worried about that than doing what God's called you to do. And what I love about this is that Jesus gives us such a big gift, the gift of sight, that when somehow power blinds you, Jesus wants you to see that there's something bigger going on than just you, that God is doing something bigger than 
the affairs of your own kingdom. And when you can start to see that, it opens you up to see and to live for something bigger than yourself. There's something bigger. There is a king, not just competing in all these little priorities. There's a king of kings. So live for him. What happens next? Well, for Pilate, historians tell us that he eventually made or he encountered another political riot. There was another uprising that wasn't so easy to squash. The Samaritans rose again against him. He lost his governorship. Um, He was perhaps recalled to Rome and executed. We don't really know. But what we do know is that every human being has to answer the same question about power, who's really in control. And the words that Jesus offers Pilate and the promises that are available by his death and resurrection, it's all still available to each of us. Those of us who look up at that ugly Roman cross to find a beautiful savior. Alistair Begg says it this way, each of us has to come to a point where we get asked the question, who is Jesus for me? Why did he come? What did he do? And how does it matter for me personally? So this Easter, as you think about the tragic and mysterious life of Pontius Pilate, I want you to think about how power may be blinding each of us in overt or maybe really subtle ways. And I think this story calls us to question, what does it really mean to worship the King of Kings? Where are spots in my life where I must humble myself to look up at my Savior and trust Him? This Easter, when you think about the empty tomb, I think we all get a small picture of what God's up to, the renewing and restoring of the kingdom of God. But when it comes down to it, are you willing to follow him as king, or are you going to fight for each of our petty little kingdoms? Those are the sorts of questions about power that the story of Pilate challenges us. And I think the answer to that challenge looks an awful lot like following Jesus as the King of Kings. So Father in Heaven, Spirit, Son, can you give us the vision to see your power? Father, can you give us the vision to see the conviction to see all the little ways, maybe the big ways, that we are motivated by power, whether it's trying to get more or trying to protect what we have. Father, can you forgive us for all the times where we fail to see the glory of God? Can you open our eyes to see your son, Jesus? Can you open our eyes to see the kingdom of heaven? And can you help us to be a part of what you're doing around us? Can you help us to love each other? Can you help us to love others? May you empower us to be servants and ambassador of your kingdom, O King Jesus, as we follow you where you lead. I saw this in the name of King Jesus. Amen.